All right, we're talking definitions. We're, uh, you know, last week we talked about keeping the eternal perspective. We, 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 go back one, please. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Work hard, learn to be content, pursue righteousness. These are the things that we're to do. Uh, we are also to keep an eternal perspective, not to get kind of caught up in the bog and the rundown of everything that goes on in life, especially with everything going on in the news. You can start watching the news and get really angry and really fearful and all that. But keep an eternal perspective. Keep your head up. Keep thinking one day we're going to go to heaven, right? Value your ministry, use your gift, don't be ashamed of the gospel. And along with that, don't be ashamed of the gospel is our next point, which is be willing to sacrifice for the gospel, for the good news, for what you've received. Um, Paul says this, don't be ashamed of the gospel or, or me and my chains, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So there's something, there's, there are times when we are to sacrifice for the kingdom of God. We don't like the word sacrifice, um, you know, because sacrifice has this, this death involved in, in having to give the, pay the ultimate sacrifice of dying, and nobody wants to die. Uh, and so, you know, people kind of back off a little bit when you start talking sacrifice, and they're like, hey, easy there now. Let's just, let's just talk about being nice to one another or something. But Paul... Paul is serious when he's saying to Timothy, be willing to sacrifice for the gospel. Some people love the idea of God and serving and, you know, but when you start talking about sacrificing their time, sacrificing their energies, sacrificing their finances, uh, simmer down there, pot roast. That's what some people say in their mind, right? Okay, let's not get way ahead of ourselves. Pump the brakes a little, Pastor. And so it's just... People get a little bit nervous when you start talking about, look, God's expecting you to serve. He's expecting you to be a witness. God is expecting you to give. God's expecting you to help out. I mean, that's what God expects. I mean, we don't just get to have a free ride. That, that's not what God wants of us because it's not good for us. You know, and then there's this shrink of losing out whenever sacrifice is mentioned. Like if, if, if you're asked to give up your time or to volunteer or to work, or you're asked to give up your finances, you're asked, and we don't do much of that here at this church. I, I know some churches, I, I talked to a pastor, we had a pastor's meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, and he said that, that he, they talk about finances in their church every Sunday. And... Um, I was like, wow, you know, I don't. I, I just, I trust that, that the people in our church are givers because they've been given to. And so we just, we have an expectation of people to give without, without ramming it down their throats constantly. Now and again, I teach on tithing. I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not ashamed to do that. Some people don't like it, but usually the people that don't like pastors talking about money or tithing are people that aren't giving. That's just the truth, okay? I've been doing this a long time. But uh, people are fearful of losing. You know, what am I going to lose out? And, and the, the, the deal is what we, never, what we never think about are the rewards. There's a real reward to, to sacrificing time for somebody else. You know, I mean, you talk to, you talk to people in our church that have been teaching Sunday school. You talk to people in our church that are working in the back in the sound booth area, you know, doing sound, doing PowerPoint, doing the camera work. You talk to people that have been greeting. You talk to people that have been, that have been serving at VBS. The, the week that people serve at VBS, I mean, that's, that's some of that, that's, their high, that's the highlight of their week. I was just telling Joni yesterday, last year I had the opportunity to go up to a junior high and high school camp. I'm 55 years old, and they asked me to be the keynote speaker at a junior high and high school camp. It was the largest camp they had ever had. They usually have between 350 and 400 kids. 500 is like, they're, they're like closed. They just couldn't turn kids away, and they ended up having 621 kids there. I mean, we couldn't even, I couldn't even walk. I had all these plans of things I was going to do, and there were literally kids at my feet. And I only kicked six or seven of them, <laughs> and two of them on purpose. No, I'm kidding. But... Uh, you know, I, I, Joni and I got to go up there. We spent the whole week at the camp. We spent the whole week, these old people, we're, you know, we can get the senior discount at Denny's, and then we're speaking at the camp. 
and playing with the kids at camp. And that week, I told Jody that was the highlight of my year last year. That was the best week of my life, giving to someone else, sacrificing for the gospel. And so giving of your time, giving of your energies, doing things for others, even if you're a little bit afraid. You don't think God can help you? You say, well, I'm too afraid to do this. What? God can't supply? What if everybody said that? Who would watch, who would teach the kids? If everybody said, I'm too afraid to do this, who would run the sound system? What, how would we, who, would, who would be on the worship team? Who, what would we do? If everybody took that attitude, what would we do? There, we wouldn't do anything. So think of the rewards, how God can fill. Not what you're losing, but how God can fill. And, and let me tell you, if God knows he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. But if all you're going to do is hold on to your own stuff and not do anything for anybody else, God's not really interested in blessing that because it doesn't bless his kingdom. God wants to promote his kingdom because his way is the right way. And so he's all behind his way and promoting his kingdom. And when we get on board with that, we get swept up in, in that wave of his anointing and blessing. I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of the gospel, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. That was, Timothy couldn't give him help because Timothy was pastoring the church at Ephesus. And so Epaphroditus with, left Ephesus to go with Paul in Timothy's stead so Timothy could stay there and pastor. And then Paul was then now sending Epaphroditus back to Timothy. So be willing to sacrifice for the gospel. Be strong in the grace of God. Be strong in the grace. A lot of times people just see be strong. You know, we, you know, live strong. You know, Lance Armstrong, you know, I mean, be strong. All this just, you know, we got to be strong. But not in ourselves. We got to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying that we're to be not, not strong in our own strength. And that's just, that's a big problem that we humans have. He said, we're going to do it on our own. We're going to make it happen. And, um, and, and Paul's warning Timothy, or not warning him, but he's just saying, hey, here's where your strength lies. Your true strength lies in God, not in your ability to serve God, but in God's ability and empowerment to help you to serve him. But so many of us get stuck in this rut of trying to serve God, trying to do things in our own power. And, and we fail because our strength, none of us are strong enough. None of us. This, and, and, and part of the reason it's not about physical strength here because this is a spiritual battle. So, you know, let's say you got the sharpest sword and, and you got, you know, muscles galore and you're just hacking away at the demons and they're laughing because you're in the physical realm trying to, trying to attack demons and attack, you know, spiritual issues, and it's in a different realm. What, what puts us into the spirit realm is faith, is a vehicle to that realm, and prayer. Worship is also a vehicle to that realm. Also, the Word of God is spiritual. It is the very Spirit of God. So when you're speaking the Word of God, those words not only carry through human ears, but they also will transport and go into the spirit realm. So it's in Christ Jesus, being strong in him, in his, in his ability. And it's, it's coming to a place of relying on him. And you remember one of the things I talked about with faith is that when you come to the end of yourself, that's where God begins. But you've got to come to the end of, we've got to come to the end of ourselves and our own strength. And that's where God starts and takes over for us. And, and, and then we go, wow, I got so much done, you know. In Zechariah 4, 6, we're told that it's, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that, that he, God said to, to, to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, the word sufficient is all you need. So what do you need? 
Some of you need financial help. Some of you need help with your business. Some of you need help with an addiction. Some of you need help with your, with your diet. Some of you need help with a neighbor. Some of you need help with an in-law. Some of you need help in your marriage. Some of you need help with a child. Some of you need help with, with, with you know, just the daily grind of life. God's grace is sufficient for anything you need. But we have to call out for it. We have to ask God, God, I need your grace. I need your grace because I, I, I can't on my own. I can't by myself. And that's, that's part of what, you know, what, what we talked about with faith a couple weeks ago with, with Joseph. I cannot, Joseph said, but God will. Is that I cannot fix this problem of mine, but God will. I cannot fix my business, but God will. I cannot fix my marriage, but God will. So it's, it's that kind of faith in God and being strong, not in self, but in the grace of God. This is, this, is, this is why our true strength comes from walking in His grace. And what is grace? All that we have comes from Him. Is that, that gratitude of what God has brought us, the gratitude of who God is in our life. God, give me the grace to handle whatever I need to handle. And there's things you need to handle. Every one of us has things we need to handle that only we can handle. I know as a pastor of this church, there's some things that only I can handle. I can't rely on my staff. I can't rely on Joni. I can't rely on the district office. Like my, my, my pastor from, uh, from Southern California, Paul Rister, Dr. Paul Rister, called me this morning. We talked for an hour on the phone. And uh, I can't rely on him. I asked him a number of questions, and we talked about a lot of things. But I can't rely on him for anything. There, um, on, for some things, I can. I can rely on him for some advice and things like that. But there's some things that only I can handle. Just like with you, there's some things that only you can handle. Nobody else, nobody else on this earth was put here to do what, you, what you're to do. And so, two ways to handle it. I'm going to just make it happen. I'm going to grip my teeth and I'm going to grind it out. I'm going to use what I have to use and do what I got to do to get the job done. Or, God, these are things that are on my plate and I need your help with them. That's the prayer. That's the prayer. Is just remaining and then, and, then, and then always then thanking God for that strength. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. And then that puts you in the right frame of mind when, when you're realizing that this is not by my power or not by my might or clever or, or, or creativity, but by the Spirit of the Lord. So you stay glorifying him and grateful to him, which keeps you humble. And then we're to multiply ourselves. And trust reliable men who will be also qualified to teach others. This is, this is to be ongoing, okay? This is to be ongoing. What, what you've learned from God, you're to share with someone else so that they can share it with someone else, so that they can share it with someone else. So that, and, and how do you think the church, over 2,000 years old, is still going strong? It's been, it's been passed down from generation to generation, from leader to leader to leader. One of the cool stories in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 10, there were five kings. Now, kings in those days weren't necessarily kings of a nation, but their king, like, like it could have been a city, okay? So they're, they're, you could think of it like this. There were five mares. They got, not mares like in female horses, mares. <laughs> like, in, like in kings of a city. You had the king of Jericho. Jericho was just a city. You had the king of, uh, now, now David was a transcendent king in that he was the king of a nation that was, uh, that was nations. I mean, he was the original Caesar, you know? He was the original Alexander the Great, only he had a heart for God. But, but, but Joshua, as they came in, in Joshua chapter 10, the nation of Israel is taking the land, and there were five kings that, that raised their armies up and they came and attacked David and they fought him and they fought him and they fought him. And this is when David, you know, commanded, you know, that the sun would stand still and the sun stood still so they could finish the battle. Well, when the battle was all done, the, the kings were left and, and 
The, the thing that, jo, that Joshua did that was so cool is he called some of his younger officers up. He called some of the young officers up, and he says, I want you to put your feet on the throat of these kings. And what that did for these guys, that, that they, Joshua was, was passing the baton of leadership over to these young generals because they were going to be, Joshua was soon going to be departing the earth, and he knew it, and he was passing the baton on, just like Moses passed the baton on to him. Multiply yourself. Find people and, and, and begin to share what you have and mentor people. It's a beautiful thing. You think, well, I don't know what to say. You know a lot more than you think. And here's the thing. When you put yourself in that kind of a position, that's when you really start reading the word. That's when you really start studying. That's when you really start listening. That's when, that's when, when, when your faith becomes activated because you have to share it with somebody else. And then they'll start asking you questions, and you got to research it out. And you learn more, but I learn more by teaching you guys than, than, than you probably do from learning or listening to me. Paul wanted Timothy to reproduce himself in his church and his community. You know, and that's how the church grows. Paul would often tell his followers, follow him as he followed Christ. So, I heard this said one time, I think it was John Maxwell that said it. There's a lot of people that think they're leaders out there. And he would say this, if you think you're a leader, stop, turn around, and see if anyone's following you. Because <laughs> if no one's following you, you're not a leader, you're just out for a walk. Get people to follow you. You do that, and follow you as you follow Christ. And you do that by, first of all, listen, I cannot inspire any of you to serve Christ if I cannot inspire myself first. I have to be inspired to read the Word of God in order to inspire you to read the Word of God. I have to be inspired to worship God in order to inspire you to worship God. I have to be inspired and inspire myself to give in order to inspire you to give. I can't tell you how wonderful the water is if I'm not swimming. But once you start swimming, come on in. I'm not going to splash you. I'm not going to try and dunk you. I'm not going to try and push you in. That doesn't work. That just gets you scratched. Okay? What we're going to do is get in the water and have a ball and in invite you to jump in. And that's, that's really what Paul's telling Timothy. Get in the water and start splashing around and invite people to jump in. You'd be amazed at how many people would, would be interested. Our problem is we think, well, they won't. They won't be. So we, we shoot ourselves in the foot right from the get by saying they never will. Paul was all about multiplying himself on missionary journeys. That's what he did everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, found people that were interested in the Bible, interested in God, interested in changing, interested in growing, interested in being someone different. And Paul would spend some time with them. And you don't have to spend a lot of time, but you do spend time with people and you start pouring yourself in. Hey, this is what I read. This is what I learned. This is what I saw. This is what I heard in church on Sunday. And you start, you grab the notes on Sunday. Why do you think I do those notes? One is so you know I finished some, I'm going to be done sometime. So you have a little hope during the message. Two, to activate you to, to engage more than just your ears when you're sitting in church on Sunday, but also to give you something to take home and share with others. Every Sunday, you get a Bible study for the week with people that, that don't know. I love Kim Parrish the other day. Uh, she sits up here a lot, and, and, and uh, a couple weeks ago, she, she wrote you know, a bunch of notes. She always writes mad, furious notes during, during church. And then she posted her notes on Facebook. And said, oh my goodness, you know, how great church was and all the notes that she took. And, and, and so she had a picture of her notes on Facebook. And then somebody underneath said, what church do you go to? I, you guys, you're leaders. That's why you're here tonight. Is because you're leaders. Not because you're, 
You're, you're just followers. See, I'm a follower too. I'm a leader, but I'm also a follower. I've followed today. My pastor called me, and, and I gave him all the time he needed. We were over an hour on the phone, and I didn't have it. There were some things I needed to take care of because I'm going out of town tomorrow. But I'm not going to let that opportunity go to follow him and listen to him. And then I was able to get things done anyway. So, you know, as Christians, our first job is mentoring at home. Seeing our family serve Christ is the most important thing. I love what... Um, the prophet Malachi in Malachi chapter 2, he said this. He says, you know what God desires from your marriage? Godly offspring. Husband and wives, it's one of the greatest missionary fields that you'll ever have is that your kids. That's your first missionary field. God desires to see from our marriages godly offspring. And you know what? It might take a while. Joan and I pastored a church. We pastor a church. We are ministers doing this for a living, professionals. And um, we raised two kids, and um, we raised them right. We really did. We weren't perfect parents. We weren't perfect parents by far, but we were good parents. We were really good parents. We were involved in their life. We encouraged them. We disciplined them. We, we, we did the best we could, but we did good. And we still had our oldest son just say, chuck it, man. He didn't want anything to do with it for a while. But we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. And there were times that he told us to stop praying for him. I mean, that's Brooks. He's so outspoken. Quit preaching the word. Quit talking about the word. I don't want to hear the Bible. I don't, don't, stop praying for me. Because we were, he was, we were driving him crazy. Well, no, nah, the Holy Spirit was driving him crazy. This Holy Spirit just, because he kept listening to, to Joni and me, and, and that was his will. Find someone to mentor him. Right now, now my, both my sons, Brooks and Chad, are serving Jesus, and, and I'm getting to mentor both of them. I know, isn't that great? Being an influencer is the highest calling we have in life. I hope on these uh, see a prayer, see a chair, pray someone there. I, I really hope, one, that if you've not done one, that you would consider doing it. Because it's putting your testimony on record, and there's just something cool about that. Number one. But number two, there are people, like, I don't want to embarrass her, but Cassidy did a great job. Um, uh, Cassie Andrew did a great job doing her, um, uh, see, a, see a chair, her testimony, right? And, and there were people that invited Cassidy to church. And so they're getting to watch that as well. And... And it does their heart good, not just that Cassidy's coming, but that Cassidy is coming because they invited her. That's being an influencer for Christ and seeing someone's life change because you invited them to church and they started coming to church and then they started growing in the Lord, all because of you. Is there anything better than that? Is there anything you can do with your life that would be greater than that? All the while... You do your job that God called you to do. It's, it's a win-win. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people and make them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I'll come down and speak with you there and I'll take, this, they'll take of the spirit that's on you and I'll put the spirit I'll put the spirit on them. That's really what mentoring is. is. Is taking the spirit that God has given you, the Holy Spirit, and it's, and it's sharing it and showing them to someone else so that they can help carry the burden of life 
for their own burdens and the burdens of others in their life. Because I'll tell you now, Cassidy's invited, she's invited people to the church. And people come to the Lord because of Cassidy. And so this, this not prayer chain, not a daisy chain, not a soul train, but this, this spiritual train keeps rolling and more people are brought and added in. Endure hardship. This is not easy. What we do is not easy. Serving Christ is not easy. Is there easier things to do with your Tuesday night than come here and listen to me? Absolutely. Are there easier things to do than go to church on Sunday? Oh, my goodness. I mean, there's a million and six things you can do with your Sundays. I mean, you don't even have to think of things. There's just things that'll drop in your lap. There's a million reasons why you're too tired, it's too hard, it's too whatever to not read the Bible. I mean, this is, a, this is an uphill battle. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna kid you. There's easier ways to live, but not better ways. But there's easier ways. And easier is not always good. I mean, the easiest way to eat food is microwave it. But let me tell you something about Hot Pockets, if you don't already know. <laughs> they're not so easy going down. They're easy to make, but they're not so easy going down. God asked Jeremiah this question, Jeremiah 12, 5. If, if you, did I skip a slide? Yes. Yeah. Hardship is not only a part of life, but an important part of our Christian walk. It, it's necessary. We need hardship. Okay? Because it's during the tough times you find out not only what you're made of, but it also gives you a testimony. You don't have a message if you don't have a mess, if you haven't had a mess. So you don't have a testimony if you haven't been tested, if you don't have a test. We need tests in order to have a testimony. We need messes in order to have a message. That doesn't mean that we go out and make messes. You don't have to make messes. They're going to just make themselves for you. Just, yeah, just show up and there's going to be a mess. But it's what gives, it's what made David so readable in the book of Psalms and so comforting and so much help for people. They read the Psalms and they think, oh, these words of David are so beautiful. Well, yeah, but David had to go through hell and back in order to have that kind of a heart, in order to, 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 to learn that about God. He had to go through difficulties. And it's, it's the hardships, you know, and this is where God asked Jeremiah this question. If, you, if you've raced with men on foot and they've worn you out, how are you going to compete with horses? Now that ought to tell you, and I don't say this to frighten you. I say this to encourage you. That ought to tell you and give you a little glimpse of how God views you. He expects us to compete with horses. If you stumble in the safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? When the time, in other words, Jeremiah, if, if you think t life's tough, how are you gonna how are you gonna do when it's really when it's when it's when it is tough, when it's really tough? But God's not just saying that to to, to get after Jeremiah, but He's saying that to encourage Jeremiah. He's telling Jeremiah, "This is how I see you." God expects a lot out of us. But only because he knows what we're made of. Because he made us. I, I remember the first time when, when Brooks was born. And then with Chad, too. Uh, I mean, when they're born and you watch the way the doctor takes that baby and just grabs them and they're just, and you're like, be careful with them you know and the doctor's like man they almost just throw them on the table and you know da, 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 you know and they're just like you're like you know barely even want to touch it you know and what those doctors know is those little babies are pretty tough they're very fragile they're very very fragile but they're very very tough and resilient just like us we're very very fragile it doesn't take much you know, we've talked about my, my friend Rocky um, Satani and got his 
scratch on his arm and got infected and died. 56 years old. Very, we're very fragile, but we're also incredibly tough. God knows what we're made of. He knows what we can handle. I love what uh, Ron Mel, he uh, was a pastor of a church up in Beaverton, Oregon, very, very large church, and uh, wrote a couple books. Uh, but he was diagnosed with leukemia. And um, when they got the news, they were really shocked, and they were really, he and his wife, they were sitting there, and they went and had coffee afterwards after the doctor's appointment. The doctor informed him why he was tired, why this was going on. It's because he was positive for leukemia. And his wife looked at him and said these words. The servant of the Lord is, is um, um, my mind went blank. Do you remember it? Indestructible, that's it. The servant of the Lord is indestructible until the Lord's done with him. The servant of the Lord is indestructible until God's done with him. You're indestructible until God's finished with you. But when God's finished with you, like Rocky, a paper cut can take you out. You know, a scratch can take you out. So God knows how strong we are. One, he's, he's put his word in us. He's given us his spirit. And then we're to, we're to grow in the grace and walk in the grace and be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus. So we have God's grace. We have his word. We have his spirit. We also have the mind of Christ. So yeah, he thinks very highly of us. You can handle a lot more than you think you can. We will. I believe that. I believe we will endure these hardships. I, you know, I hear we have people in, in, our, in our church, just like every church, I'm sure, but they go through some hardship and they quit. Breaks my heart. It's my heart to hear about, hey, where's so-and-so? Or you call them and they're, ah, uh, you know. They're going through hardship and they just quit the church. And it's like, like there's an answer out there better? What, what is it that's going to that's gonna give you what you need that's out there? I mean, it's just, no, nothing. I mean, you know, it's just, it's heartbreaking. We have to fight the good fight. We have to stick with this. We can endure more than we think we can. Where am I at? <laughs> Keep your head in all, thank you. Keep your head in all circumstances and, and endure. Just endure. Endure hardship. It's, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Um... Who went to Mexico last year? Yeah, you guys went to Mexico? It's not that bad here, is it? <laughs> it's not that bad. I mean, we're not in the Middle East. Not for a week, it isn't. <laughs> not for, yeah, no, I'm saying it's not that bad here. No, no I, it's whatever you're complaining about. Like I, I sat with the ministers, a bunch of ministers from our division, and I asked what frustrated them. I think I shared this with you, and they started talking about all the frustrated women. I was like, man, I'm never complaining again. I, I've, got, I've got it so easy. I mean, this is, this is too easy. I'm not trading them, though. I'm not going to trade positions with them, but... You know, there's, there's, this isn't that bad, guys. I know you're all, we're, every one of us in this room is going through something. Endure it. You can. You're stronger than you think because God's in you. And we started this out with being strong in the grace Amen. that's in Christ Jesus. Stay focused. And, and hardships, hardships, struggles, difficulties, they can get us off track. They can, get, they can get us so focused on the problem rather than, hey, this is not so bad. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please the commanding officer. And so Paul is telling Timothy, you're a soldier. You're a soldier in the Lord's army. Um, and, and then Roman soldiers in Paul's day, a few interesting things about them. First of all, if you were a Roman soldier, you were not allowed to marry. You had to wait until your, till your service time was up before you could marry. 
You couldn't engage in any kind of trade, any kind of off the books, outside work at, of any kind. Punishable by death. The Romans were very serious about their soldiering. That's why they captured so many countries. They were very serious about their soldiering. And if you were a soldier, you did not do anything outside of soldiering. And it could be punishable by death. You didn't marry. You were forbidden to be involved in any activity that was not military related. They wanted 100% of your focus. And the principle was that they were, they were, they were also excluded from any relationships or relations, agencies or engagements, which it was thought would divert their minds from soldiering from the pursuit of soldiering. There are so many things that can divert our attention, divert our minds. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we go into this strict uh, legalistic kind of a thing. I'm not saying that at all. But the flip side to that is we don't want to become so nonchalant about our Christianity and our faith in Christ there's, there's a balance, and we walk this balance. One is, is grace and not religion, not rituals, not, not um, you know, legalism. But on the other hand, not just being so casual about God and our Christian walk and our faith, right? We, we, need, to, we need to be balanced, and, and that will help us to, to stay focused and pursue, continue to pursue the Lord continuing to pursue his word and pursue opportunities to serve and give and do. Uh, see, the Roman Empire, why it was so, it's, it's so important is expansion and protection was the utmost concern. The Caesars wanted to expand. The emperors wanted to expand and continue expanding. And then they had to protect what they expanded. And, and what does the church want to do? We want to expand. Look, I'm not happy with our attendance. I'm not happy with the size of the church we have. But on one hand, I'm very happy. So I'm very happy with the size of our church. And I'm not, I know that having, you know, 100 more people in our church isn't going to make me a better pastor. It's not going to make me more successful. That's not how you measure success. But numbers are important. And I do want to see our church grow. Because I want more people to come to Christ. I want more people to find the Lord. So we want to expand, and we also want to protect our church. Well, vigilance, staying focused, that's important. Being devoted, being trained, that's important for all of us. So Paul viewed himself, Timothy, and us as soldiers in the Lord's army. So we are to be well-trained. That's why we preach the word here. That's why we encourage you to read the Bible through from cover to cover. That's why I'm doing this class. I really want you to be well-trained. I I want you to be, you know, devoted, loyal to Jesus, not loyal to me, not loyal to a church, not loyal to a denomination, loyal to Jesus. And let's just please God. I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. He says, we make it our goal to please the Lord. Just... You know the saying, what would Jesus do? You know, that comes from that comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, thought that we would follow in his steps. So what would Jesus do? And then also, what would please the Lord? Does this please the Lord? And we start, we start letting those kind of be the guidelines for our decisions in our life. Boy, things start getting better. And that's a good way to stay focused is what would Jesus do? And would this please the Lord? Would this attitude that I have towards this person, does that please the Lord? Do, do the words that I just said about that person, does that please the Lord? Does the generalization I just made about that group of people, does that please the Lord? You know, does, does holding on to unforgiveness or anger towards someone, does that please the Lord? You start asking these questions and it helps you stay focused on, on the task at hand. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy. We do have an enemy. That's why we're soldiers. We have an enemy, and he prowls around 
like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's on the prowl constantly. And listen, you can think, well, if I, I ignore him, he'll leave me alone. No, he won't. He won't. He doesn't play fair. He's, he's a liar, a cheat, a thief. That's what Jesus said. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Compete within the rules. We're fighting. We're working. But we're also to, we're also to work within the rules. Competing in any physical uh, endeavor, athletic endeavor, is more than just being physically trained and fit. There's more to it than that. It's more than just physical. You also have to know the rules. And then you compete within the rules. There are just certain tenets or certain things that we do that are guidelines, and then there's certain things that are rules. And guidelines, there's flexibility. Rules, there's no flexibility. Rules are to be upheld. Rules would be followed. Um, and then, you know, the thing about rules, they're important because that's the only way you're going to understand or know who won. You know, you just think about uh, the Summer Olympics are coming up. I love the Summer Olympics. I mean, I don't think I'm going to be pastoring those, we those, those couple weeks. I'll be watching TV. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is leading up, I'm going to get so much done ahead that I just hardly even have to come into the church. So don't want to get married during the Olympics. Don't, don't die during the Olympics. Don't need counseling during the Olympics because I really want to watch the Olympics, okay? I'm, I'm kidding. Would that please the Lord? <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, it's, it's not right to use my words on me, okay? Let's just get that square. But. No, I love the Olympics, and... It, and I love, I, love this, I, love, I love swimming. I love to watch the swimming. I don't like to watch the diving. Anything where there's judging involved, it just seems so corrupt. What I love are the events where everybody starts from here, everybody swims there, and then comes back, and then whoever touches first wins. We know who won. But, but you're not going to do the freestyle, which is the fastest way to swim, while everybody else is doing the butterfly. That's not fair. And you're not going to be able to swim outside your lane. That's not, you're disqualified. So there's, there's rules so that we can determine victory. There's rules for our life so that we can determine victory. <clears throat> you know, and this is what I was saying earlier about legalism. As Christians, there are rules, though we're not under the law anymore. The law has been fulfilled through love. Paul, talked about, Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians 6. Uh, he talks about that in Romans chapter 13, that, that love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. So the law has been fulfilled on our behalf. Galatians 3. Did I say 5? He said 3 and 5. Um, so we're not under law, but there is still ethics, morals, ways that we're to live. So... Uh, and it's because of who Jesus is in our life and what he's called us to be. And so you look at the Ten Commandments, that's a, that's a good place to start. Honoring God, honoring his name, honoring his day, honoring your parents, honoring people by not lying to them, not killing them, not stealing from them, right? So there's just some good rules right there. But Jesus summed up the rules of life in these. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are, the, those are the rules that we live under. And we compete within those rules of love. So when you're making a decision, you can say, does this please the Lord? That's love to God. And then you can also say, is this loving towards that person? Is what I'm going to do loving towards them? Is how I'm speaking to that person. Is that loving towards them? So th letting those be our rules that guide us. Um, 
our Christian faith is not like Survivor where we outplay and outwit and outlast. There are Christians that just do sometimes some of the most despicable things and call it Christianity. We talked about that with work ethic, that sometimes Christians can be the worst employees, the most deceitful employees. You're like, you said you were a Christian, and then you go and do this. I'm confused, you know? So um, I was talking to a guy the other day, and, and they have an employee, and he's a Christian. And he started work, if I get this right, he started work in the first of the year. He's missed 15 days of work for sickness already. 15 days in 45. It's like one in three. He's gone. And they're not, what do we do with him? You know? You know, they, they want the guy to succeed. They want him to do well. So we, should, we need to live by rules. Uh, we're in a competition with the enemy, not with each other. And for the souls of mankind, not for one another. Joni and I have a, just a strict rule. We have a strict rule. If we meet somebody and we start talking to them about the Lord and they tell us that they go to another church, awesome. That's great. We don't, we don't, oh, well, you should leave that church and come to ours because ours is so much better. Really? I don't know if our church is better. I know it's different, but I don't know if it's better. There are no better churches out there. They're just different. And if somebody's happy in the church they're at, leave them alone. Let them grow. You know, it's, it's, we're not in a competition with South Valley or New Hope. It's not a competition. You know, I, as long as churches are preaching the word of God, I pray for them. I want them to do well. I don't, I don't want our church to grow because South Valley or New Hope has a problem and people start leaving. That's not how I want our church to grow. So it, it's, it's just not, that's just not what we're about. That's not what we're to be about. You know, so if people are happy where they're at, let them be happy. Now, if they come to you and say, you know what? There's some of you that have left a good church to come here. There's sometimes that that happens. There are reasons to leave a church. Sometimes there's a time to go and go somewhere else and hear a fresh voice or hear a fresh, you know, something or, you know, maybe there's sometimes the way a church does their business is just distasteful for you and you need a change. You want to go to a different thing. That's fine. And then if you, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, I'm not Sure, I want to stay at the church I'm at. I'm feeling God moving us out. Where do you go? Invite them by all means if they come to you. But don't go and start, hey, man, you know, you really got to leave that church and come to ours. It's, ours is so much better. And I hear Christians talk that way. And it's like, not, not necessarily our church. I don't think that that's, that's what we're doing. But I've heard others, you know, you need to come here because this is so much better. Really? Probably isn't. There may be some things better. Maybe the pastor there is a really, really good speaker. And, you know, and, and it, it'd be better. Or maybe their worship's really better. But you're going to give up other things, too. I mean, so it's just let's, just, let's just love people and love the Lord, you know? And then if someone feels they need to go to that church or, or good. I hope it works out for you. God bless you. All right? So. Just love. It's, just, it's the rule. That's the real rule. Do you not know that you run, that you are in a race and all the runners run, but only, only one gets the prize. So run in such a way by the rules to get you the prize. And the prize is love. So run in a loving way and you'll win every time. You never lose when you love. You never lose. Well, what if they, what if they, what if they, Turn their back and hurt me because I was loving to them. You still were loving. That's good. That's good. Was the alternative is not to be loving. Is that going to be good? Never. Reflect on who you are. 
Reflect on what I'm saying, and, and the Lord will give you insight into all this. So sometimes there's reflection that needs to happen in order for us to have insight. We've grown past, as a, as a, as a society, we've grown past reflection. Or we've become too busy. I mean, we have devices that can entertain us all the time. We can watch something. You can't hardly even go to a restaurant anymore without televisions on. When did that happen? I don't want to watch TV because I get interested. (laughs) And Joni's like, I'm here talking. I'm like, I know, but there's, there's a slam dunk contest on right now. We were at, having lunch yesterday together, day after Valentine's, having lunch, just having a day together, right? And we go into this restaurant. And, and behind me is a TV that she can see that's on a different channel, Law & Order. When is Law & Order not on? Some Law & Order with some actors are on. And then in front of me is a TV that had... Uh, a, a dunk contest on from the years back, you know. And we're talking, and I'm... <laughs> and then she starts doing this. Because she wants to see what I'm looking at. And um, I thought maybe I should invite her over on my side of the booth and we could cuddle. <laughs> but I think she would have saw it. It would have been easier to watch the, the, the dunk contest. But there, no, what I'm saying is, we don't reflect. We're listening to something in the, radio, in the car. We're watching something in restaurants. We're watching something at home. It's just constant. And we need to find time just to... I have, I have time in the morning every day where I just... I want quiet. I want to be by myself. Joni... She, she loves to go and be by herself for a while. We both have to be alone for a while. And, and this is in context with what we just talked about, about reflect on being an athlete, reflect on being a farmer, reflect on being a soldier. You know, reflect on these things. These are who you are and how it relates to you. Competing within the rules. Reflect on these things because you're a law abider. You're a rule. You follow the rule of God, which is the rule of love. You do. This church follows the rule of love as good as any church I've ever been a part of or ever seen in my life. This church right here. There's not a lot of gossiping. There's not a lot of backbiting. There's not a lot of clickies. You might find that there are, but and and but. Anybody's welcome anywhere as far as I'm concerned. We try to have that kind of a spirit. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't segregate by age. You know, you're too old to be on the platform. You know, uh, you're too young to take communion. You're too young to be on the platform in the worship. You know, so we just don't. That, this church is one of the most loving churches I've ever been a part of. I feel incredible love from people and support. And concern for my health, my health, my wife, my kids. I, I mean, it's amazing. Soldier endures hardship, stays focused on the assignment. An athlete competes according to the rules in order to win the crown. And then the hardworking farmer is just he's patient, not plodding, but you know, there's just something to farmers. They just they get up early. They take care of their business. This is who we are. This is who we are. Reflect on that. Paul wanted Timothy to consider. Did you not get those? Farmer. Yeah. Yeah. I know sometimes I can get going fast. I like to talk fast. I like to talk fast. My feeling is if I talk fast, it doesn't give, you don't have, you don't have any time to think about other things. But if I start wondering what to say, your mind starts wondering and then wandering. So I like to talk fast because then you don't have any time to do anything else but listen, all right? So it's just, for me, it's an effective tool for teaching. 
Sometimes I can get going too fast, though. Paul wanted Timothy to consider who he was, who he'd been called to be, and then go out and live it. Why not? Is there a better way to live than what God says? Is there a better way to live than love? Is there a better way to live than hard work? What, laziness? Shirking your duties? Is that better? Wouldn't you rather get an A on a test than an F? But you got to study for the A. So study actually becomes good. So, I mean, let me tell you, there's not a better way to live than what God's called us to, to, to do. And who God's called you to be. Who he's made you to be. But we just... We lose sight of our calling. We get distracted from our assignment. And then, then we sometimes we get lost. And then we think, oh, forget it now. I'll never find my way back. Really? You're just a prayer away from finding your way back. But I guarantee you, you can try to find a happier way to live. You won't. The devil wants to distract us by getting us to participate in civilian affairs. Just things that... By civilian affairs, we're talking about just stuff that, <clears throat> that's out there that's around you but isn't, isn't related to who you're called to be. Getting us off course by breaking the rules. And then, and then let me tell you what the world's going to do to you. It's going to wear you out. It's going to burn you up. And it's going to leave you with nothing and then spit in your face and laugh and then tell everyone about it. That's what the world does. Uh, do we have to go through the list of names of people? No. Just watch, the, watch television for a while. Okay, so the world, the world is just going to... It's not going to be kind to us. We follow Christ, he's going to guard us. We follow Christ, he's going to cover us. He's going to protect us. He's going to keep us strong. And then finally, let's, let's just do this last one here. Just remember Jesus Christ. It's all about him. We forget him too quickly. I don't think we, we're, I'm not saying people forget God, they're bad people. It just, sometimes life creeps up on us and the next thing you know, we lose sight that it's about him. We make it about us. We make it about our dreams. We make it about our goals, our plans, our need to get away, our need for this. And, and the next thing you know, we've, we just, Jesus isn't really a part of the picture anymore. So, <clears throat> and, and we can get so wrapped up in the rules sometimes the legalism of it. There are good churches out there that have, that have wandered from the faith. There are denominations out there that, are, that, that don't even serve Christ anymore, but they didn't start out that way. When you look over the church history, there are churches that started out serving Christ and after a while it became about serving the machine and keeping the lights on, and keeping things going, and the grind, and the next thing you know, Jesus isn't even a part of their denomination anymore. And it's sad. I'm not going to name any of them. But we can get so caught up in the regulations of church, and, and, and all the do's and don'ts, and the religious stuff, that it's ne it's not, it, it, it ceases to be about Jesus. And then after a while, Jesus says, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a stranger here. I'm not really welcome here anymore. And then you know what it's called? Ichabod. The glory has departed. It's a Hebrew word, Ichabod. The glory has departed. It's the good news of Jesus Christ, not the good news of man, not the good news of a worship team, not the good news of, of a preacher, not the good news of a church or a denomination. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. He's the one who died for us. Which is just astounding. I can't wait to see the movie Risen. It's coming out soon. I think, I think it's on the 19th. Friday. Friday. Friday? Mm -hmm. Woo! Can't wait to see that. You know? Because that movie's about, it, it's going to end up being, it's about Jesus. 
you know, and those guys, they missed it to preserve their position. When, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, here's what the Pharisees said. Somebody went and told him, hey, this Jesus guy raised Lazarus from the dead. And immediately the Pharisees said, we have to kill him or we're going to lose our position with Rome. We have to kill him. The guy just raised something from the dead and all you can think about is killing the dude. Really? And then you're shocked when he rose from the dead? And then Paul used the words, you know, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. Just remember that he's the king of kings. He's the king of kings. He's over all. He's the first. He's the last. He's the Alpha and Omega. The forever and ever, amen, so be it. Jesus. It's all about him. People get wrapped up sometimes in prophecy and in times, and they forget it's about Jesus. They get so wrapped up in his second coming. But, you know, John said in, in Revelations 12 that the spirit of prophecy is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the spirit of, the spirit of prophecy. But there are so many people that in, in, in the world that are in the church that are, oh, you know, they're going to this church and that church because they want to receive a word. They want a word. No, you need Jesus. You don't need a word. You need Jesus. That's who you need. And we get, we get off focus. We get pursuing God. We forget Jesus. And Jesus is God. Got to be careful of that. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to him saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget Jesus. Let's, um, anybody, anybody, any questions real quick? Um, Let's bow our heads. Jesus, it's all about you. Shame on me for, get, for forgetting that sometimes. No, not shame on me. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I don't need any more shame. I need forgiveness. Forgive us for forgetting about you, Jesus. But this is, it's about you. It's not about us. It's not about our next thing. The, the whole point of prophecy is you, Jesus. The whole point of the church is you, Jesus. The whole point of sharing the gospel is you, Jesus. It's, it's all about you. And God, I pray that every one of us in this room, that our love for you, Jesus, would grow. I pray my love for you will grow. And everyone here, in Jesus' name, amen.